heading into the mountains to help you understand natural hazards. This time Warwick's heading up the film crew to make sure you don't miss any of the action. You ski with it in your hand? Yeah. You can't see anything. <laughs> you know, the, with the light yeah. on, the, on the screen. Yeah. That's what I put you. First up, it's avalanches. I think Warwick's ready to go. This is what is called a loose snow avalanche. The uh, really reassuring aspect of this is that not many people are actually killed by these things because they tend to fracture below you. Uh, the only problem with this one is that I am below it. Um, so as you can see across the slope there, there's a second one. And this is a kind of slope which would be prone to, to avalanches. Now, all I've got to do is get across it and try and avoid another one. The real killers are slab avalanches, killing 120 people per year in the Alps alone. And the best way to survive them? Don't cause them in the first place. Mount St. Helens in Washington State erupted in May 1980. It was and still is the most catastrophic eruption to hit the US and miraculously only 57 people died. At 8.32 a.m., a magnitude 5.1 earthquake triggered the largest landslide ever recorded. The landslide destabilized a bulge on the north side of the mountain. The volcano didn't erupt upwards, but sideways, spilling out a pyroclastic cloud at 600 miles an hour and 400 degrees Celsius. Are you okay, sure we right. should be sending in? No, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. I really don't think this is... No, really, it would be absolutely fine, trust me. <laughs> See, I told you everything was going to be okay. What? What's the matter? What would we do that for?
Nevado del Ruz is the highest active volcano in Colombia. In 1985, an eruption melted one quarter of the ice cap on the summit. This meltwater caused a devastating mud flow called a leja. This wall of mud, ash and boulders tore down the mountain, a wall of dirt 30 meters high, heading for the farming town of Armero. When Mount St. Helens erupted, only 57 people died. And this is staggering considering it was one of the biggest eruptions in modern times. The United States Geological Service have been monitoring the volcano and set up a five mile exclusion zone. And this, in part, saved an awful lot of lives. But when it did erupt, helicopters swung into action really quickly and took people to a central area where they were provided with food, water and blankets. This wasn't the case at Nevada del Rus because the scientists gave out warnings but the authorities in Bogota disregarded them and accused the scientists of trying to damage property prices. As it turned out, property in Armero, the town at the bottom of the volcano, was about to become worthless. About 30,000 people lived in the town, 23,000 dead that night as Lejas thundered down the mountain. The problem also was the timing of this because it occurred at about midnight when most people were in bed. Now these 23,000 people that died, a lot of them would have been farmers and they live at the bottom of the volcano because of the rich volcanic topsoil that it provides. And this is typical of low income countries. There are a number of factors which have a massive impact on low income countries and it comes down to three P's. Prediction, protection and preparation. In Armero, when the helicopters arrived, they had politicians in them and news crews. What they desperately needed was equipment and tools. In fact, when water pumps arrived, they were broken and they needed these to stem the flow of the rising meltwater. It's the same story with earthquakes. It's 2010 and these Chilean workers on the 12th floor of this office building are about to experience an 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake. This powerful earthquake resulted in 500 dead, over 12,000 injured and 9,000 people homeless. 26 hospitals, 4,500 schools and 53 ports were destroyed. In April 2015, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck Nepal. 9,000 people died and 3 million were left homeless. Seven thousand schools and fifty percent of all shops were destroyed, leading to food and supply shortages. Rice crops were also destroyed, which resulted in food shortages across the country. Many modern buildings collapsed due to a lack of building regulations. Many of these buildings were not built to be earthquake proof. So here's what I don't understand. If Nepal was a 7.8 on the scale and Chile was a, an 8.8, .8, surely they're not much different in size. And yet in Nepal, 9,000 people died, whereas Chile, only 500. You see, the problem with that is that the difference between a 7.8 and an 8.8 .8 doesn't sound like very much, but it's actually 10 times more powerful. In fact, if you look at the turn in terms of the amount of energy released, it's probably more like 31 times more powerful. All right, I get, yeah, okay. That still doesn't explain why the death toll is so different between the two places. Um, if Chile is more uh, powerful, how come more people didn't die? It pretty much comes down to how rich you are. I think Chile is about the 39th richest country in the world, whereas 
Nepal, on the other hand, is way down on the list with uh -huh. 109th position. And so Chile has got an awful lot more money. And right. when the earthquake hit, and you've got to bear in mind that a tsunami also hit uh -huh. at the same time, that those sort of 500 people were saved because the emergency services swung into action really quickly. Also, if you bear in mind that they use that money, they use oh, yeah. those emergency services to get the north-south highway up and running within 24 hours. And that meant that you could rescue people. And it also meant that the rebuilding of this area was immediate. It was within the first few hours that this was all sorted. Nepal, on the other hand, no, they suffered more badly and relied more heavily on yeah. international aid from countries like the UK right, and also yeah. organisations like UNICEF.